So here's the way that I kind of did this. Um, I have read all this stuff, believe it or not. And um, what I did, having already taken the exam, as I read through it, I made sure to make note of what I thought was the most important for the exam. All right. Uh, that doesn't mean I got, you know, got it 100% right. Just because I didn't say anything about it doesn't mean it's not important and vice versa. Just because I say something doesn't necessarily mean you'll find it on the exam. It's just kind of my opinion on what the highlights of each section are regarding the CFE exam. All right. Um, so I put slides together for each section. I have tips along the way. I have, hey, focus on this. You're definitely going to get a question along the way. I have tips for don't read this mess because it's too much and it's useless along the way. All right. So I guess my role is just kind of keep you on the, the right track and minimize your time and uh, kind of get your focus in the right thing. Right. Okay. So this is the easiest section, the, the one we started with. Um, and I think that you probably would realize that after reading chapter one of it. All right, chapter one is just pure walking around knowledge. You already have it in your head for the most part, right? It is accounting concepts. So my slide, you know, very basic accounting knowledge we should be familiar with. And I'm talking stuff like, what's the accounting equation? We know that. Debits or cre and credits, you know, it could be something as simple as debits are on the left. That could be a question, right? Um, it could be something like, you got to make sure your debits and credits equal. It could be something like a debit increases an asset, a credit increases a liability, stuff you know, all right, stuff you better know. It could be stuff like definitions of assets, liabilities, equity. Uh, I put the accounting cycle in there. It's kind of hard to get questions about that, I think. Um, you know, things that they might have would be like, you know, the purpose of an adjusting entry maybe or uh, permanent accounts versus temporary accounts. Remember that, you know, your balance sheet accounts are permanent. Your temporary accounts are the ones on the income statement. You reset them every period. Something basic like that. Um, what's on the balance sheet? What's on the income statement? What's on the whatever their version of the equity statement is? They might call it statement of owner's equity. They might call it the statement of retained earnings or they might, you know, whatever they call it what it's on the cash flow statement, what is gap, you know, simple, simple things. All right. This is a, a section you don't really have to spend a whole lot of time on. Um, now, as you get on into the fraud aspect of everything, and these are not hard type questions, but uh, maybe a little harder, they might say something like somebody's trying to commit fraud and they are, booking a fictitious revenue, all right? What might the other side of a journal entry look like? All right, so you have to think, all right, booking a fictitious revenue. So that means they're crediting revenues. That means they have to debit something, all right? So then you look in there and their question might be something like, you know, can they decrease an asset? No, you got to debit something. If you debit an asset, that's increasing it. So it might be something a little more complex, but still dealing with the basic accounting equation, right? adding that little complexity in there you know they stole cash you know how do they balance that you know do they increase a liability decrease a liability increase another asset decrease another asset something like that so the way to approach that is to just think about basic accounting equation and keeping it equal right um so yeah that's that's pretty easy stuff so as you get a little bit you know this I don't really necessarily all call all this uh, walking around knowledge. I don't know if y'all noticed this. They haven't updated for the new revenue recognition standards. So they're still saying revenue is recognized when it's realized or realizable and earned. Uh, I don't think they want to go any deeper than that. You know, these new revenue recognition rules are, they're pretty deep, right? They're not going to get into that kind of depth. If they can't ask uh, an incorrect question, so you probably won't get anything using the old revenue recognition stuff. It'll be 
more examples of things and you know I don't think it'll be you know I have that on there but that's not true anymore right so this is not the thing but they'll talk about the matching or expense recognition principle they'll still use the word matching in their questions probably I don't know they may not now um, but then the other little assumptions and principles consistency full disclosure objectivity going concern all right it could be a question that's a simple definition you know going concern means and then there's four choices and one of them's your definition more likely they'll give you an example you know so and so auditor decided that they may not last beyond a year uh, and what violates you know what assumptions violated here you know going concern you know, something like that so these are pretty easy too, right? Um, you know, so and so bought a piece of uh, equipment and recorded it at fair value. What did they violate? They violated historical cost. You know, something super easy like that. So and so didn't tell about a lawsuit that was coming up. What did they violate? Full disclosure. I mean, there's no point in studying for something like that, right? It's just the questions are so easy. So. But that's the type of things they'll ask from this material. Um, you know, time period assumption, unit of measure. I don't know what they could ask on the monetary unit assumption, but anyway. And then all these characteristics, relevance, materiality, faithful representation, comparability, consistency, verifiability, timeliness, same type deal. Uh, probably an example, and they'll say, this is a good example of the characteristics of whatever right so super easy section you'd like to get as many questions as possible from this one um, I don't really have a whole lot else to say on this you know it, it's real easy you know with uh, you know expense recognition they might give an example of somebody putting expense in the wrong period and they say well what did they violate Expense recognition period, uh, principle so, pretty easy stuff. Um, let's see, was materiality in there somewhere? Yeah. So, materiality, I don't think I put cost benefit up there, but they might phrase that as something like, you know, when could you depart from gap if it's not material? Uh, I think another way, you know, you can depart from gap if there are industry specific things that go on or you, you can actually depart from gap if adhering to gap strictly would prove to be misleading you can actually depart from gap if that's the case so something like that uh, easy little section right so that knocks out 27 pages right there There's probably no reason to ever revisit that any questions on that section any comments anything that jumps out at you is hey they might ask this too yeah, nothing to it, right? Um, okay, so let's see. Section two. Oh, I was going to point out on like, I don't know where it is. Oh, no, it is section two. On section two, it begins with this giant diagram. Don't, y'all probably wouldn't anyway. Don't try to make sense of those stupid diagrams that's a waste of time you know they've got all this charted out um, they call it the fraud tree and that's about the most useless thing to me I, I don't like pictures of things like that I like just reading the words so that's a good wasted page that you can just skip right over in my opinion you may like that though all right so section two all right we're getting a little more meaty with this one so this one's called financial statement fraud. We got 60 pages here. Um, so we get into, it's more fun to read. You know, we get into ways people commit fraud. And uh, they often give examples in the book of whatever type of fraud they're talking about. Those are fun to read sometimes, but skippable if you're not wanting to read all this stuff. All right, so what do we got? So we start with types of fraud. Um, so they're talking about occupational fraud. All right, 
this test is big on definitions. And this test is big on examples of things they talk about. You know, those are, that's a big part of the type of questions you get. So a lot of definitions to kind of know. Occupational fraud is using your occupation for personal gain. All right. Um, now, that's a big term that kind of covers a whole lot of the stuff we're going to look at. Corruption, stealing assets, financial statement fraud, using your occupation for personal gain. Definition of fraud. I underline the really important parts of this. These things you have to have for fraud to be present. And I can guarantee you'll get at least one or two or three or four or five questions that get at this point. There has to be a deliberate misrepresentation. An error is not fraud. If you accidentally do it, you've not committed fraud, right? It has to be a deliberate misrepresentation. Um, we're specifically talking financial statement fraud here. So a deliberate misrepresentation of the financial condition of a company accomplished through intentional misstatement or omission. So deliberate, intentional, um, in order to deceive. All right, so it's intentional. It cannot be because of an error. We are trying to deceive somebody. That's what fraud is, all right? Um, almost always involves what you would obviously expect, overstating assets, overstating revenues, overstating profits, and then, of course, the other side of all of that, understating liabilities, understating expenses. But could be the opposite. You know, you may do it the opposite way to play, pay a, uh, a smaller tax bill or store up reserves to use however you want to in a future year. But usually you're overstating assets and overstating res revenues. Uh, and you know, that could easily be a test question. Why is fraud committed? <clears throat> so they list a whole bunch of different things. And um, we're specifically talking about financial statement fraud right now. So why do they do it? And again, this could be a question, which of the following is a reason fraud's committed? The answer is usually D, all of the above, right? Um, to buy more time to fix problems, business problems, right? It's like, oh, we had a bad quarter. Let's clean it up and maybe we can kind of reverse it out next year, quarter when we do better, smooth it out a little bit. Uh, to avoid negative market perceptions. We don't want Wall Street to look at this and say, eh, these people are headed the wrong way. We want to keep ourselves looking better um, to get better financing you know, or any financing to comply with loan covenants for financing you've already obtained, right? They may require you to keep certain ratios at a certain level and you may have to fudge the numbers to get there, right? Uh, you know, if you're a top executive, it may be to obtain bonus money that's contingent on you hitting certain numbers, right? Or, you know, just ego. Hey, people to think I'm screwing up, so make it look like I'm doing better, right? All right, we mentioned this last time. This is an extremely important point, so I gave it its own slide. Perception of detection is arguably the strongest deterrent of fraud. Remember that. That'll help you with several test questions, probably. You know, you'll see questions along the way, and you know, if, if perception of increasing the perception of detection is one of the answers, that's probably right. All right. Another answer that's never wrong is segregation of duties. That is always right. All right. I can't think of a situation where segregation, or I think they call it separation of duties, but I'm going to keep calling it segregation of duties. That's the way I learned it, and that's the way I always say it. That is never the wrong answer, all right? That's always a good thing, no matter what you are talking about. That is the, always the right answer. All right, increasing the perception of detection is always the right answer, too. All right, so we get into different types of revenues, but or different types of fraud, but um, on the stuff we just looked at, you know, what types of test questions, we already kind of mentioned it, but, um, they'll probably hit on reasons why people commit fraud and probably be one of those D all of the above type things. There'll be definitions of fraud. There'll probably be a question where they try to say somebody mistakenly greatly overstated error or 
overstated revenues. Was it fraud? No, it's an error. They didn't mean to. Um, all right. Okay, fictitious revenues. So we're getting into some details now. Types of fraud, ways people commit fraud. So we're just putting fake revenues on the book here. We're recording sales that didn't occur or services that didn't occur. All right, so we know we're crediting revenue here, right? So the other side of the entry is often tricky. Okay? If we're crediting revenue that doesn't exist, what are we going to debit? The answer is usually accounts receivable. And again, that's a good test question that, you know, it, it's so common that that would be a test question on, AC, on the CFE exam. We typically hit accounts receivable. All right, so let's back up. Recording sales that didn't occur, we got to cover our tracks. How do we do it? We might have fake customers. We might have legitimate customers. We might uh, prepare a fake invoice, never mail it, never deliver it. You know, we may alter existing invoices to boost the numbers up or boost the quantities up. We may ship defective products. You know, we may just send a big old shipment that nobody ordered and say, hey, revenue earned. And, you know, send it on out and then they send it back and you put it back on the book somewhere else and keep the revenue on there. I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways that people might do this. Um, typically you're going to boost your AR up. All right. And that's fake too. So you got fake revenues and fake accounts receivable on the books. So a big red flag is receivables that are never collected, right? If they're not real, nobody's going to pay them off there's your red flag for it, right? Um, long overdue receivables, receivables from customers that you can't find if you're an auditor or an examiner. Uh, a red flag is always big, good, you know, big, good transactions toward the end of the period. You know, that's always a nice red flag. Doesn't mean that fraud definitely occurred, but it's like, oh, giant sales on December 29th. We better look into that. That's a red flag. Uh, and, you know, if you're looking at uh, financial statement ratios, um, if it takes, you know, day sales and receivables, a ratio that measures how long it takes you to collect your receivables, if that day, if those days are getting longer, that's a red flag. Uh, um, so fictitious revenues, that's a big section. Um, types of questions you might get from this would be the red flags, probably, you know, uh, typically about the accounts receivable being on the books for so long. Um, that's a likely question you'll get. In fact, I can't think of much else they would ask you on that. You know, fictitious revenue question, probably going to be something about accounts receivable. It really will. Um, okay. So another type of financial statement fraud. Timing differences. All right. This is the this is the term that they use that could be a test question answer. You know, this is an example of what type of fraud, and the answer is timing differences. It sounds weird, but that's 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 what it is. Timing differences is just sticking something in the wrong period. Hey, I need a lot more revenue right now. Let's stick it now, even though it should be next time, right? Or vice versa. It's not following revenue recognition rules. Um, you know, smoothing out income. Plain and simple. You know, there's no, we don't have to get any deeper than that, really. It's just putting in the wrong place, expense or revenue. It doesn't have to be just a revenue. Um, they uh, they had a very specific term in there, which could certainly be a test question. It kind of has that name that lends itself to kind of knowing what it is. It's a very descriptive title, channel stuffing. So, you know, think about what that, you know, what kind of visualization you have when you hear channel stuffing. I see a, a channel, I'm stuffing a bunch of stuff in there, right? They're selling a whole bunch of stuff uh, to people. They're encouraging them to buy way more than they normally would. They're giving them discounts. They're giving them good terms and things like that. It's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not fraud, but you better disclose it than it is if it, if you don't disclose it, then it's kind of fraud. Why? Because 
you're selling a whole bunch of stuff now, which means you're not going to sell a whole bunch of stuff later because you've oversold to them now. So it kind of lends itself to this timing difference. It's a legal way of doing it as long as you disclose it. But uh, you're kind of hitting revenue right now to the expense of later, right? So you're taking from future period sales. Um, timing differences. What could be here? You know, they might get into some of the basic revenue recognition things with this section, right? The timing differences thing, uh, like long-term contracts, you know, percentage of completion versus uh, completed con no, not versus. It's just complete uh, percentage of completion. You know, they might have a little very basic question on uh, the timing of a construction contract, or you know. Uh, they'll give you a situation where they didn't follow the right timeline or whatever, you know, something basic like, uh, you know, somebody prepaid you for a service and you went ahead and recorded as revenue even though you hadn't done it yet. What did you violate? You violated timing differences. It's, it's kind of weird. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing you get there. Real basic stuff. Yeah, that's a type of fraud. So creating fake revenues, putting revenues in the wrong place, improperly valuing your assets. Uh, so now you're trying to strengthen the balance sheet. Um, it could be the other side of your fictitious revenues that you've doing. So you could kind of double dip there. You've got fake revenues. You got fake assets. You're hitting both. Um, you could tweak your estimates to your advantage if you want, because we got a lot of estimates we can manipulate. A lot of them dealing with fixed assets. You can screw around with your useful life. You can screw around with salvage value. Uh, you can deal with um, bad debts on your accounts receivable. You can tweak those the way you want. You might have obsolete inventory that you ignore and keep that inventory on the books. You can do a lot of things to improperly value your assets. Uh, another little specific term that jumped out at me in that section was window dressing. I'd never heard of this before until I read this book. That refers to classifying long-term assets as current assets so you can make your liquidity ratios look better. I've never heard of that before. So I stuck it in there because it was interesting. Um, specifically, they go into the different accounts for inventory. So our book says most Improper asset valuation involves overstating inventory or receivables. Um, and we kind of mentioned some of this already um, a little bit you know, with obsolete inventory, but going deeper than that, you know, we have rules with inventory. We're supposed to write it down to market, lower of cost or market. We may just choose to not do that. You know? So that would be improperly valuing your inventory. Uh, and getting on into other things, we may miscount the inventory. We may boost the cost on our books, unit cost, which would boost the total cost. We could get some co-conspirators involved. and They could say, yeah, we got some of their inventory over here. They consigned it to us, but they own it. So, you know, you got that. Um, you could say you have a lot of stuff in transit that the auditors can't get at. So depending on what the shipping terms are, those belong in your inventory. Uh, bill and hold is a very specific term too. Um, you record items as sales owned by third parties, but you include them as your own inventory. And I already said about the consigned goods, that could happen. So in kind of obvious ways to do this. Manipulating your uh, receivables, um, failure to account for the uncollectible accounts, manipulating the confirmations that the auditors will be doing, dealing with, you know, have them sent to a mailbox that your company controls or somebody that's conspiring with you controls, sneaky stuff like that. Um, but yeah, um, oh, we got more stuff here. Business combinations, so you could improperly value assets as a result of some of these complex things that go on with mergers and 
things like that or acquisitions. So you might be acquiring another company and you might establish these reserves for different expenses that you can stick as an asset and release them into earnings later on. You know, that gets pretty complex. Fixed assets, you can just have fake assets. You can have fake any of these things we talked about. Or you can uh, boost them up to market value, or you could capitalize things you shouldn't capitalize, right? Things like that. Um, so what kind of questions would you get from this? Probably pretty easy ones. Probably things like, uh, what if you, since we're on this slide, what if you um, capitalized something you should have expensed? What will that do to the income statement? What will that do to the balance sheet? What if you expense something you should have capitalized? Really easy stuff like that. Um, well, what else could they do? Mm -hmm. Really things along those lines. Um, you know, what if you didn't record a bad debt when you should have? How will that affect the balance sheet? And that would be a kind of a one that make you think a little deeper, right? If you don't record bad debt expense, that means that you haven't recognized an uncollectible thing on your balance sheet, right? So you've overstated your assets. You've overstated your income. Things like that that really get back to the accounting equation, right? All right. Moving along. So... We've created fictitious revenues. We've stuck things in the wrong period. We valued our assets wrong. Now we're hiding liabilities or taking our expenses down, right? Our book says these are really easy to hide, so it's hard for examiners to uncover these. Yeah, take an invoice that would kind of show that this exists and throw it away. It'll be hard to uncover that, right? You got a litigation out there and uh, judgment against you, liability to pay. Just don't disclose it. Hide that liability. Don't record the liability. It, pretend like it doesn't exist. Uh, you may sell a product that has warranties involved with it. You know, if you remember back to Intermediate 2, we had an adjusting entry at the end of the year where we estimated the warranty cost that we expect to incur as a result of the sales that we made this time. Just not do that or really understate that. Um, so that's the kind of things you can do with liabilities. Um, improper disclosures. So this is this is good question, test question stuff right here. Easy questions to, uh, to, to write. You know, subsequent events, related party transactions, changes in accounting, Contingent liabilities, probably not as ripe for test questions or backdating stock options, but I stuck it on there anyway. Um, subsequent events or things that occur after the period end that could affect the current period that you're reporting, like a court judgment or something like that, you're supposed to disclose that. Uh, contingent liabilities, if you can, if they're reasonably possible and you can estimate it, you're supposed to disclose that. The only time you don't disclose the contingent liability is if it's remote, right? Um, change in accounting. You know, if there's a change in accounting principle, you're supposed to you know, disclose that. If there's a change in estimate, some kind of disclosure ends up on the books because of that. Um, if you don't do it, you've done it wrong, right? Related party transactions, um, you post, you have to disclose those, right? They're not wrong, and that might be a good test question. You know, is it wrong for them to be dealing with their uncle who owns this company? No, it's wrong to not disclose it, right? So, uh, you know, related party transactions, yeah, you've got to disclose those. Those are very important. You know, you might be dealing with somebody and, you know, hey, they're giving us a little bit of preferential treatment, which is good, but you know, if somebody else bought the company from me, they're not going to be related to that person, and they may not be able to continue getting that uh, preferential treatment, right? So you got to disclose that kind of thing. 
not disclosing it is wrong. All right, so yeah, that's the type of test questions you get there. All about disclosing or not disclosing those. Pretty easy stuff. All right, uh, detecting these types of things. So now we get into the different analyses we can do and then different ratios. All right, I'm sorry, you do need to memorize these. <laughs> They're easy though, it's the easy stuff. Um, now you don't have to memorize how to do a vertical analysis or a horizontal analysis. They're not gonna make you crunch any numbers. Um, you just have to know what those are. All right, vertical analysis is looking at everything on the balance sheet, for example, everything is a percentage of total assets. All right, income statement, everything's a percentage of sales. You know, it common sizes everything. Horizontal analysis is looking at trends, looking at changes across periods. That's really all you need to know about those things. You know, one of them is all within the statement, one of them is looking across time, right? Simple definitions is probably the, the extent of the questions you get on vertical versus horizontal analysis. Now these ratios, they'll hit you with these formulas, but they're easy. We know what a current ratio is, right? They expect us to know that, we know that. We know that's current assets over current liabilities. We probably know what the quick ratio is off the top of our heads. It's essentially the same thing, except we're knocking inventory out of it and prepaid expenses and other oddball current assets, but it's cash, short-term investments and accounts receivable divided by current liabilities. We probably already know that. Debt to equity is easy. The name of the ratio is the equation itself, right? Debt divided by equity, or total liabilities to be more specific. Although debt to equity in, can mean something different in a different textbook. Different textbooks call them different things. But yes, yeah, liabilities over equity. Profit margin, we know what that is. So all these are pretty easy. The turnovers are probably the only ones you kind of have to revisit a little bit. You're taking an income statement item and a balance sheet item on each of those, kind of matching them up. So on the accounts receivable turnover, you know, you're looking at how receivables hit the income statement. They, they are sales, right? As are ratio to the balance sheet portion of it, right? What's on the balance sheet accounts receivable. Same with inventory. They hit the income statement as cost of goods sold as a ratio to the inventory on the balance sheet. Those are all you need to know, all right? They're easy enough, but yeah, you'll get questions that will make you know those formulas. You don't have to crunch any numbers with them. You just have to know what they are. Um, Simple definition stuff, it's just that the definition is the formula. So, you know, nothing to do. And, you know, that might be a question on what is this test? You know, the current ratio test, the ability to meet short-term obligations. So you might have to put some of that into words a little bit. Um, but, yeah, memorize those. And then out of nowhere... I don't know why they stuck this in that section about interviewing techniques, um, but they did. It doesn't belong in this section. There's a lot bigger sections on interviewing people later on, so um, you could probably skip this for now, but I stuck it on there since it's there. Uh, so we'll talk about it, because it's important. Um, talking about interviewing is kind of a fun part of this course, too. Uh, so out of nowhere, they stick this on there. They make a few important points. There's no liability in general for you, the fraud examiner, that's who you are, to asking questions that you have a legitimate interest in. It doesn't matter how insulting it is. Um, so they say you are legally able to be fearless in asking questions as long as it's done under reasonable circumstances and privately. It you know, says uh, the legal right does not extend accusations. And that's where good test questions come in, right? Which of the following is something you wouldn't want to do? You know, are you still cooking the books? You don't want to say that. That's accusing them of cooking the books. If you say, are you cooking the books? Then you're okay. So you can kind of see the difference there. Um, so you can ask anything as long as you don't accuse. That's kind of the bottom line on this. And then they have a little tip. One person at a time, for obvious reasons, right? If I expect 
all five of y'all are cheating. I'm not going to say, all right, let's talk about this. I'm going to get all y'all individually and say, all right, tell me your story. And then we'll see if everybody matches up. And that way y'all don't get your stuff straight and start working off each other, right? And uh, they also say generally the, the top people are interviewed first. They're usually the ones involved with this financial statement stuff. Um, preventing. All right, so this kind of gets at the fraud triangle that really pops up in a, in a later section of the CFE exam, but you minimize those three things. Minimize the incentives, minimize the pressures, minimize the opportunities and rationalizations. Obvious things, don't put unattainable goals on them. Don't, um, or do actually, have good records, of course, good internal controls, good security, good segregation of duties, always a good thing. Uh, as managers, need a good ethical tone at the top, they always say. You know, don't give them a way to justify doing stuff by saying, well, that's what he would do or she would do. They're kind of jerks, those managers, so I'm not doing anything different than they are going to do. Uh, having internal auditors is a good thing. Having external auditors is a good thing. Um, these things pop up later in the course, better sections than this. So um, that pretty much wraps up section two. Um, a lot of meat there, but the questions tend to be pretty easy from this section. Pretty logical stuff. Any questions, any comments on this one? All right. Very good. Let's keep moving. Skimming and larceny. All right, this is kind of a fun one. This is an easy one, too. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely need to know the difference between skimming and larceny. All right, that is a 100% guaranteed test question right there. So you got two categories of theft here. You got skimming. You got larceny. It's both stealing. It's just a difference of when you do it. All right, skimming, you are taking before it gets into the records. Larceny, you're taking after it's already in the records. That's the only difference. So, you grab cash out of the cash register after it's already been rung up, that's larceny. You take it before you ring it up, that's skimming. So, that's the difference. Um, so, the book says these are by far the most common of all Occupational frauds, using your occupation to commit fraud, stealing stuff. Right. Skimming versus larceny, there you go. Skimming is stealing, I say money here, but you can also steal any kind of assets, really. Um, and larceny, so the only difference is when. All right, so more on skimming. You can steal sales, you can skim receivables. As long as you do it before they're recorded in the books, that's called skimming. Hard to detect because obviously there's no audit trail. It never got recorded. Um, people who are able to easily do this are those dealing with customers or those who handle customer payments. That's pretty obvious, right? So people at the cash register, people who are opening the mail for people sending in payments and things like that. Those are the ones who are able to do this easily. Um, sale skimming. So you make a sale collect payment, don't record the sale, keep the money, simple, right? Uh, it won't show up in the sales records. It will show up, and this is an important thing, especially for test questions. Where does skimming sales show up? Shows up in inventory shrinkage, which we'll define later. You don't really have to define it, you know what it is. Um, but we'll put a more, a better definition with it, but it is, yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, let's save it for later. But that's where it'll show up. Skimming receivables. Um, this is a little harder to cover up because there's an expectation that the customer is going to pay what they owe at some point, right? With unrecorded sales, nobody knows it ever happened, right? So skimming receivables is a problem when there's not good segregation of duties. If you've got somebody who's collecting and posting payments, that's a problem because they can collect it themselves and post it however they want to or not post it at all. If you've got two people doing this, it's harder to do. Uh, so you're stealing receivables. 
you're stealing payment as it comes in. You got to cover it up. So how do people cover it up? Lapping. That's a guaranteed test question right there. That is, y'all have heard of lapping, I'm sure, before. That is just moving stuff around in customer accounts pretty much, right? You steal a receivable. Uh, somebody paid, so uh, you, you take it from their account, move it to this account. Later on, you move it to another account. You just keep it moving around. That's lapping. Lapping is hard to keep going. It comes crashing down eventually. It's just too complex. Um, but knowing what lapping is is going to be important. So, hey. So, it's so complex. You know, it's so complex that whoever's doing it's going to have to have a separate set of records so they'll know where everything is, right? Um, of course, you've got customers, you've got late notices that are going to be sent out. If one of those customers who's paid gets a late notice, then they're going to say, hey, I got a late notice. I paid this thing. So, and then they're going to go in like, well, it's not showing that you did. And then, you know, it's so hard to keep it all going. Now, in the bullet point next, you can intercept those late notices and uh, you, know, you can change the customer's address so they won't receive late notices. You know, there's ways to keep it going if you're slick enough, but it's so complex that it comes crashing down eventually. You know, it's just so hard to do. It's harder to do the wrong thing than to do the right thing. It is harder to do the wrong thing than the right thing. You're exactly right, yeah. Um, yeah, if I'm stealing stuff, lapping is not something I'm gonna try to keep going because it's too hard to do. It'd be so stressful. Yeah, I wouldn't want any part of it. <laughs> do what? I said you're just trying to figure out how to steal something. I know sometimes this is like a how to commit fraud manual instead of how to. <laughs> Didn't know I could do this lapping thing. We'll yeah. give that a try. Yeah. <laughs> what, you really wonder though, people that are committing fraud, do they look up more things like this to try? Mm, right, right. But, and then they're like, all right, well, let's see what red flags are going to be there, and I'll try to make sure those red flags don't happen. But I don't know. We've gotten pretty slick as far as detecting things, and simple analytics will really bring a lot of it to the to the surface you know, luckily. Um, one of the things, I love this fraud analytics course. Have y'all ever heard of Benford's Law? Have y'all ever done anything with Benford's Law? Benford's Law is the coolest thing in the world. Um, so Benford's Law was developed, somebody looked at the frequency at which the first digit in a normally occurring number is one. How often is that a one? How often is it a two? How often is it a three? And they have a certain expectation about how often that happens. So if it's naturally occurring numbers, it should fit into those things. If it's made up numbers, it's going to get out of that. So in that fraud analytics course, what I did, my wife has a business. So I took, um, I forgot how many of the checks she had written, but I just keyed them all into Excel and said, let's apply Benford's law to these real checks that my wife wrote and it worked out perfectly. Now, before I did that, I said, hey, y'all are committing fraud. Uh, write checks to yourselves. Everybody write 10 checks to yourselves a piece and tell me what your numbers are. And we keyed those in and did Benford's Law and it discovered it immediately. It's really cool. Yeah, Benford's Law is awesome. Um, anyway, yeah, we've gotten pretty slick on detecting stuff, so that's good. Um, okay, what are we doing? So skimming receivables, and there's short-term skimming where you can just, uh, you know, you're saying when when do you discover lapping? So this would be tricky. It's like, all right, I'm gonna take some money temporarily, earn a little interest on it, do a little lapping in the meantime, then put everything back, and now I've earned interest on that. So that'd be even harder to do, harder to catch. <laughs> you're like, hmm. <laughs> short-term skimming like this <laughs> yeah or you know somebody might be like well I'm going to uh, 
skim some of these receivables, take it to the casino, triple it, put everything back. In the meantime, I'm doing a little laughing. And of course, they're going to lose. And then, yeah. <laughs> a lot of these times, people aren't smart. Mm-hmm. Yep. Very foolish. Yeah. And as you get deeper into this course and you see some of these examples of people doing it, like, what were they, th- how did they think they were going to pull that off? And, you know, you kind of, I, at least I'm like always having my mindset when I see these frauds, I feel like it's like really well planned out and they've got it all, you know, intricately devised in their head. And usually it's just like, hmm grab some money and they don't really think about how they're going to cover it up. Yeah. It's not very clever. Um, all right. So that's skimming questions for skimming is going to happen. Um, they're going to have definitions about skimming. They're going to have questions about how skimming is harder to detect than larceny because it's not in the records. Um, they're going to have probably examples. So-and-so did this before it was recorded in the book. This is an example of skimming is the answer. Um, what else might they do? You know, they might even have, this would be one of the harder ones, I guess. Um, how might we detect skimming? So the answer might be we might detect it by checking out inventory somehow, you know, looking at some kind of ratio with inventory or doing some kind of observation of inventory, uh, something like that. Because if you're skimming sales, um, the inventory has gone. You just didn't record the sale, so it's going to show up there. So it might be something like that. Um, okay, so that's skimming. Larceny. It's just straight up stealing. You know, that's reaching into the cash register and grabbing a handful of cash. Harder to get away with because it has entered the accounting records. Um, you know, there are ways they can try to conceal it. You know, if you're at the cash register, you might ring up a refund. You might void something, you know, something like that. You might, um, you know, do something like that. I was about to say you might never ring it up, but if you never ring it up, that's skimming. So, no, that's not larceny anymore. So, you might do something like a refund or a void. That would make it larceny because it had to enter the accounting records and now you're removing it, but it's still in the records. It's in the records where it came in and went out already. Um, that's not much else we could say about larceny questions you would get would be examples again, you know, so-and-so uh, logged into a co-worker's register when they weren't looking and grabbed a handful of cash and took off running. What is this? Larceny, right? Um, you know, somebody opened their cash register and took some money. Larceny. It doesn't have to be somebody else's cash register. Um, think what else I didn't put in a slide but ways to kind of catch this would be setting up some kind of observation system you know or at least the idea that you're being watched, right? Cameras on, you know, you know, like you go to Walmart, and that self-checkout, and you've got that camera where you're seeing your face there. Mm-hmm. Nobody's probably ever looking at that, but oh my goodness, that thing's intimidating. I, I look up and I look down. I don't even like looking at myself in there. You know, I'm not going to steal from the self-checkout because you know, they got that thing pointed right at you. I don't know, but um, you know, that'd be a way to keep... <laughs> Do I... Because really that lighting in there is so, yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah. So I look up, I look down, I'm like, oh, I look pretty sketchy now, don't I? I don't even want to look at myself. Um, so that would be a way to, uh, to keep that from happening, um, making them think that you're going to bust in there every now and then and 
check their drawer or something like that. You know, that kind of thing would be a way. Um, and this as well, um, rotating people around, making people take mandatory vacations is always a good way to detect fraud. You know, fraud is an ongoing thing. You got to keep on, keep on. If you're lapping, for example, that's an ongoing thing. If you're forced to take a week vacation sometime during the year, that might come crashing down during that week. So that's a good way to detect fraud. Um, um, okay. I think that's about all I have to say about that section. Any questions or comments on it? So that was all about skimming versus larceny. Yeah, that's a pretty easy little section as well.